Same thing. Hopefully. That's one of the real things, but we're going to talk about something much more real today. But I'm going to ask you, if, uh, we're going to do kind of a quiz right away, and ask you some questions, and I've got candy if you're fast and give me the right answer. Um, <laughs> so, all right, we're going to do some true or false. The first one is, the Bible says, yeah, I better read these so I don't get wrong. The Bible says that God helps those who help themselves. True or false? True. Okay, I heard... heard Something over here. Dan, what'd you say? Now he's got to read. I don't know if that counts if you guys read it again. True or false? True is wrong. So you don't know. Okay. All right. Next one. The books of the New Testament were written centuries after the events they described. True. Who said false? Almost made it. Need a heavier piece of candy. <laughs> Next one. Cleanliness is next to godliness. True or false? False. You said false up here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the ones who said that, I think it was messy ones. You were messy ones. Okay. All right. Well, you would think it could be in there, but it's not exactly in there. Okay. Next one. According to the Bible, the earth is flat. False. Who got false first over here? Oh, it's Pam. Pam's chicken dinner. Oh, sorry, Pam. Okay. All right. All right, next one. The earliest... I read that one already. Um, oh, my God, I mixed up the night. Okay, the Bible teaches that the earth is the center of the universe. True or false? True. Okay, who said true? Oh, yeah, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but you were good, you were fast. That was it. That was it. Otherwise, and you were the only brave one that said anything. So, the English Bible is a translation of a translation of a translation, etc., of the original, and fresh errors were introduced in each stage of the process. True or false? False. Gary, I think that was you. You gotta come. I don't make like this. I'll make it. Put it back there. The trash can. Actually. All right. So, um, so, did anybody catch a pattern in there? They were all false. Yep, they were all false statements, but often we think some of those are true, don't we? Sometimes there's skepticism, and the fact is, with few exceptions, a lot of people have already reached their conclusions about the Bible a long time ago. And a lot of times they reach it through second and third hand information. And that's too bad because it's a rare person who has personally examined the text to see if all these contradictions are really true. Someone who says that the Bible is full of contradictions should at least be able to name you one and then show you where it is and so you can challenge them about it. We're going to break down that question today and over the next month we're going to talk about the Bible and about it being true or false. We're going to look at its reliability in a number of different areas. Today we're going to look at it to see if it's historically accurate. So we're going to break that down, whether the Bible is reliable in four subcategories or questions this morning. Is it authentic? That means, is, is, the, is, it, is there a textual reliability with the Bible? Is, it, is what we have now a fair representation of what was first written? Number two, is it accurate? Is, it, is what we have now a fair representation of what actually happened? So first we have, is it, a, from, is it from the first writings, is it fairly accurate? Is it a fair representation of what actually happened at that time period? And third is, is it authoritative? Does it have doctrinal reliability? Is what we have now a fair representation of what God wanted to talk to us about, to communicate to us? And lastly, how was it accumulated? How do we know that the right books were chosen to be in the Bible? Those are all really good questions, so we're going to look at those and answer them, at least to, to as good as we can, anyway. 
So we're going to start with the Bible's reliability. There are three lines of evidence that support the claim that the biblical documents are reliable. The first step is called the bibliographic test. This test examines Bible manu biblical manuscripts. The first test examines the quantity, quality, and time span between the oldest copy they have and between what we have now. So when they look at it, in the case of the Old Testament, there is a small number of Hebrew texts still out that we have been found. Um, the, problem, the reason there isn't a lot of them is because when they, the Jewish scribes would hide them, and they were made, and they were also written on stuff called papyrus, and that stuff doesn't last forever. <laughs> it just doesn't. And so those ancient manuscripts are often lost or destroyed during Israel's turbulent history. I mean, if you read through the judges and the kings, I mean, the enemy came in and they burned down the temple. The enemy came in and they destroyed the temple and everything in it. And that's where they kept all the, all the documents. But the existing Hebrew manuscripts we have now are from the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Septuagint, a 3rd century B.C. Greek translation of the Old Testament. There's a Samaritan Pentateuch in the Targums, and there's also the Talmud. So there is a number of ancient writings. There's just not the number that we have in the New Testament. The quantity of the New Testament manuscripts is unparalleled to any ancient document of any time. Uh, there are over 5,000 Greek manuscripts and about 8,000 Latin manuscripts and another 1,000 manuscripts written in language of the Syrians and the Coptics. In addition to these ex this extraordinary number, there are tens of thousands of citations of the New Testament passages by the early church fathers. In contrast, the typical number of existing manuscript copies for any of the other works of Greek or the Latin authors are just really, really small. I mean, when you look at Plato, Aristotle, Caesar, Tacitus, it is much, when we look at Homer's Iliad, there are less, or approximately 2,000 copies of the Iliad. That's all there is. Yeah, we put a lot of, we put a lot of weight on what he, that, that, that manuscript. We think, wow, that's, that's the truth. That's the stuff we got here. There's only 2,000, there's only seven of anything by Plato. There are only 49 writings of anything by Aristotle, and there are only 10 copies of what Caesar wrote and 20 of Tacitus. So when you look at it, the New Testament has 6,000 plus, there's 24,000 um, copies of the New Testament, parts of the New Testament somewhere. And they're from way, way back. I mean, there's nothing that even comes close. So when you look at it, because of the great reference to the Jewish scribes and everything in the, in the Old New Testament, you know, they were very particular in how they copied, especially the Old Testament when they first started. They made sure that when they wrote it, somebody had to look it over. They couldn't be off even a period. If they were missing a period or a comma or a dot on an I, they didn't erase it. They destroyed it and had to start all over again with that copy, whatever they were working on. They had to be meticulous in what they were copying. And they were, that was one of their biggest jobs, is to make sure that the num they had to count the numbers of the letters and the words on the page had to match with each manuscript. So and they, they would make sure that the lines were counted, that the middle letter was the same on all the copies. So when the Old Testament was written, and then it was exact. It was a perfect copy of what they had. As a result of this extreme care, the quality of the manuscripts of the Hebrew Bible surpassed all other ancient manuscripts. In 1947, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, they looked back onto other manuscripts for about a thousand years, and even if in that thousand years, they were exactly the same. That says a lot about how, how they kept everything accurate. So while we look at the Old Testament, the New Testament is also very good, considerably better than the manuscript quality of all these other documents that we talked about. Some of the variant readings crept into manuscripts. There were some errors with copying and some errors with sharing it out loud, but overall, it never changed the meanings or the gist of what God was saying. So when they copied the New Testament, they found it to be 99.5% pure. And the correct readings, the less than 5%, there's a few things that might be inaccurate, but it's mostly textual criticism. It's mostly just little things that didn't get passed on exactly the same. But that's amazingly accurate when you think of it. 
from that time period. And the discovery of the said sea scrolls dated to 200 BC to AD 68. And so that really showed there was the New Testament, they find stuff written clear back to 68 AD. So that's during the time the people were still alive that had seen Jesus. So they could double check the accuracy. The time span for the New Testament is exceptional. John Ryland's fragment um, of the Gospel of John was dated at AD 117. And only if that was, like I said, right amidst when there was people out there art that could still hear and knew what was going on from the New Testament. Um, the average gap of most ancient manuscripts is a thousand years from their composition. But the bibliographic test, the Old and New Testaments enjoy a far greater manuscript attestation in terms of quantity, quality, than any other ancient document. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until his purpose is achieved. Jesus said that not even the smallest dot or an I or a period or the end of a sentence could be changed. It needed to stay it was going to be accurate. And that is the test of the best copiers. They painstakingly copied the scripture by transferring the writing from the old to the new. And as they copied down, they made sure each dot each letter was exactly the same. So we can trust that through the bibliographic test, the Bible passes with flying colors. Next, there's the internal test. This deals with the claims made by the authors. We are really examining the truth claims by the various authors of the Bible and allowing them to speak for themselves. Remember, the Bible is not just one book. It's a collection of books. It is, they're woven together with one, one storyline. The bulk of the Bible was written by people who were eyewitnesses of the events that they shared with us. John wrote in his Gospel, John 19.35, This report is from an eyewitness giving an accurate account. He speaks the truth so that you also may continue to believe, and from, so that you can continue to believe. And then John 21.24 says, This disciple is the one who testifies to these events and has recorded them here. And we know that his account of these things is accurate. John saw what he saw, and he wrote it down. That was in his epistle. Peter makes the same point abundantly clear. For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And now in 1 Peter he wrote, A word to you who are elders in the church. I too am an elder and a witness to the sufferings of Christ. And I too will share in his glory when it is revealed to him in this world. Peter and John said and they were eyewitnesses. So what they say is from a first-hand perspective. The independent eyewitness accounts in the New Testament of the life, death, and resurrection of Christ were written by people who were acquainted intimately with Jesus Christ. Their gospels and epistles reveal their integrity and their commitment to the truth. And they maintain their testimony even after Jesus was crucified. They, they continued to believe and they continued to testify that they had saw Jesus after the resurrection. And they were willing to die for their beliefs, for their eyewitness accounts. Most of the New Testament was written between AD 47 and AD 70. And all of it was complete before the end of the first century. There simply wasn't enough time for myths or stories to get circulated. Because when, they, when those New Testament books came out, there were eyewitness people that could verify if those things were true or false. So when the multitudes of eyewitnesses were alive when the New Testament books began to be circulated, they would have challenged any false claims that were coming out. The book of Acts and the book of Luke were written by Luke, and Luke said in the very first part of his passage in Luke 1, it says, many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. They used the eyewitness report circulating among us from the early disciples. Having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I also have decided to write an accurate account for you, most honorable Theophilus, so you can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. These words, the Bible, were written so that we can all know the truth of what was being taught. No one has ever disproven a word of Scripture. Unlike many other historical facts that began as true and have been proven false or that we are just plain old fiction, um, there's one, I want to share a few of those, they're more fun facts actually. Some of us grew up believing 
And maybe we were taught it, maybe we just, I don't know where we got some of these ideas, but did, did Benjamin Franklin actually test his theories about electricity by flying a kite in a thunderstorm? No one is sure. We know that he published a groundbreaking diagram for a lightning rod in May of 1752. That was a month before he flew his kite, supposedly. The main source for the kite story is Franklin's friend, a scientist, John Priestley, who wrote about it 15 years later. From there, the story took on a life of its own. In no version of the story, however, was Franklin's kite actually struck by lightning. That would have resulted in a chicken fried Franklin, Instead, when the storm approached, Franklin noticed that the hairs on the back of his neck and the, those on his kite were rising up. So he, re he recognized that there was electricity in the air. So we don't know, you know, I always always believe that, that, that he flew a kite. I guess I can't remember being taught that, but it was a story out there in history. Another one is poor Christopher Columbus. When we touch, so we look at him and it says, unfortunately, you know, a lot of people said that Christopher Columbus went off to discover to see if the word Earth was flat or not. Well, that isn't what he was going out there for. Um, actually, everybody by the third century BC, they, they knew that the Earth was not flat. So, so Columbus wasn't trying to prove the Earth was round when he set off in 1492. He was trying to prove that by sailing west, it was the quickest way to get to India, to the East Indies. He didn't find that out. He found that he bumped into the Caribbean islands. And um, Columbus is believed, to, you know, I don't know if he ever got to India, but one more Columbus factoid, although Columbus did briefly set foot in Panama on his fourth westward expedition, it, he really actually never landed on North American mainland, just on those islands down there. But imagine, you know, we've all been taught that, you know, some of us have been taught that Columbus was going to prove that the Earth was round. Well, he never knew that. So he wasn't doing that. Last one. This is a classic inspiration story for, and I've used this one, so I should have done my check, fact check before. For every kid who ever had a C minus on a third grade math test. Do you know who also struggled with numbers, Johnny? Anybody want to tell me who I'm going to say? Albert Einstein. We picked on him. Wrong. Um, Albert Einstein was a late group bloomer. He was slow to talk. He was socially awkward. And he didn't get the best grades in school. He even flunked the entrance exam to Zurich Polytech School. But that's not because he couldn't do math. He passed the math section. Um, in fact, he, but he failed botany, zoology, and his language requirements. By all accounts, Lil Al was an ingenious problem solver. And then the, the source of Einstein flunked math, the myth is not clear. We don't know where it came from. However, when he was shown the allegation in 1935, uh, in a Ripley's Believe It or Not column, Einstein replied, I never failed in math. Before I was 15, I had mastered differential and integral calculus. So I don't think he failed math. <laughs> in, fact, these, in fact, he ended up being a math teacher and a professor. These three falsehoods may not have been taught in history, but they were circulated in mysteries. They have been represented, misrepresented a lot over a, a long time period. As we study and look at the witness of the events in Scripture, there are no discrepancies. When you look at what they say, they all match up. And that's, and none of them have ever been proven false, even by Mythbusters, a popular television show, has tried to do that a few times, and it has not been able to disprove anything in, in the Bible yet. We can trust God's word because it is true and there's many witnesses that verify it's true. The, there's another test, the external test. It's a third test and it looks to the outside confirmation of the biblical content. Because the scriptures continually refer to historical events, they are verifiable. Their accuracy can be checked by looking into the evidence. The chronological details in the prologue to Jeremiah and in Luke 3 are two illustrations of this. Ezekiel 1-2 is another example. This verse allows us to date Ezekiel's first vision of God to the exact date, July 31st, 592 B.C. The historicity of Jesus Christ is well established by the early Roman, Greek, and Jewish sources. Many extra-biblical sources testified and wrote about Jesus Christ. We don't have, you know, it's not just in the Bible. The first century Jewish, Jewish historian Flavius Josephus 
made specific references to John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, and James as in his Antiquities of the Jews. In this work, Josephus gives many background details about the Herods, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, high priests Annas and Caiaphas, and the Roman emperors. And he mentions the four Gospels as well. He mentioned, and all of these can be found in the four Gospels and in Acts. So Josephus, the historian, and the Bible match up. We find another early secular reference to Jesus in a letter written on AD 73 by an imprisoned Syrian named Marabar Sukhukian. And this letter was written to his son. And so if we look at those things, and he compares Jesus' death to the death of Socrates, Pyrrhus, and well, he talks about these three people. Other first and second century writers also mention Christ are Cornelius Tacitus, the Roman governor Pliny the Younger, the Greek satirist Lucian, and the Jewish Talmud also mentioned Jesus a number of times. So we know he was a real factual person. The Old and New Testament make abundant references to nations, kings, battles, cities, mountains, rivers, buildings, all of those things that we can find and check out. They, they talk about the economics, the politics, there's dates. So all of those historical things we can check, and they have been checked. While we can't say that archaeology proves every, the authority of the Bible, it is fair to say that the archaeological evidence has provided external confirmation of hundreds of biblical statements. In fact, they used to say, well, that, you know, some different countries are not there, like the Hittites. They believed that the Hittites was just a made-up nation and a made-up place. But now they have found and discovered actual writings from the people of that era and of the Hittites. So we know, you know, so far they have not, like I said, have ever disproven anything by any of their archaeological finds. All the archaeological evidence supports what the Bible says. Noted archaeologists such as William F. Albright, Nelson Gluick, and Ernest Wright develop a great respect for the historical accuracy of the scriptures. Out of the multitude of archaeological discoveries related to the Bible, there's a remarkable external substantiation of biblical claims. And they name a number of them. I'm not going to read all of those because, you know, this is kind of stuff that puts you to sleep unless you're really into history. But there's a lot of cool stuff. There's a lot of different things that substantiate and prove the things that we believe that we can find in the Bible. There's some things called the Newsy Tablets that were found in 1925. There's um, other things like the Mosaic Law, which was written by, they tried to say that it wasn't written by Moses. Well, then they went back and they found the evidence of that. The law code of the Pentateuch was too, they said was too sophisticated for that period. But then they found the laws of Hammurabi, which were even before that, and found out that people were intelligent and they could write different things. So, I mean, things backed up each other. Along with the Old Testament evidence, there's a vast evidence supporting the New Testament, as we've said. Um, Archaeology has found the Pool of Siloam, the Pool of Bethesda, Jacob's Well, Bethlehem, Nazareth, Canaan, Capernaum, all those things that we read about, you can find, and you can see now, or have been substantiated. Luke had, some, had also had that criticism. They all thought, you know, thought Luke had made up people. And until not too long ago, critics often scoffed at his reference to Licinius, the Tetrarch of Abilene. But archaeologists have since found two Greek inscriptions proving that Licinius indeed was a Tetrarch of Abilene during that time period. Luke's use of technical terminology like proconsul and peer creator and all these other things that were going on were challenged in the past. But now they have been proven that he actually knew what he was talking about. Isn't that amazing? So there are books both that prove the historical accuracy of the Bible and those that dispute it too. And as you, there's people that try to prove one way or the other all the time. It's going to continue to happen. As you research and read those claims of inaccuracy, you've got to check to see if they really back up their claims or if that's just their opinions. Because like I said, there's one huge point, at least for me, is that none of the Bible has ever been disproven. Since it is an ancient text, those things that are not true should have turned up by now, if you think about it. I mean, the Bible's been around a long, long time. And if there's something out there that proves it's false, wouldn't you think they'd have found it? I mean, they really were powered at it. The Bible was written over 1,500 years by more than 40 authors. It was written in different places, 
different times, different moods, and in different continents, and written in three different languages. It was also written in different styles, and has written about many different subjects. Yet, the story that flows throughout the entire book is one single thread, one single story. God's redemption for humankind. The Bible shows continuity. That's one of the other proofs that it is true. Because there's no other book that can claim that with this much variety, this much time period that has lapsed. The story continues all the way through. The Bible is not simply an anthology. There is a unity which binds the whole together. God loved the world and humankind. This book is God's love story to us. This book can be trusted to teach us how to live. Teach us the truth to live by. The Bible is the foundation of the Christian faith and we can trust it in its historical accuracy as well as in all other ways that this is indeed the true and inerrant word of God. Paul gave this mandate to young Timothy before he died in a Roman prison. You must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. You know they are true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. You have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Jesus Christ. Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. God is preparing us for the life he has called each of us to do. And he does that through his word. We can trust his word. It's a living, in Hebrews it says it's a, it is living, it, no I can't even know it but it's living. <laughs> it's a living thing. It teaches us, it can come inside. But the best thing or the worst thing is, um, it doesn't do us any good sitting on our shelf. It doesn't do any good sitting on the coffee table. Uh, how many of you have a Bible? Good. So how often do you open it? A lot. Good. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So that's what, that's what, the only way it does us any good is by reading it and putting it into practice. So we're going to be talking about that over the next parts of the month. But I wanted you to see, I guess to me, I'm kind of a historical nun, and I like that history, and I really like it because I know my guy wins, and I like the Bible because of that. I also know that it's, I can trust it to be true. I don't have to, you know, I don't have to defend God's Word because it stands on its own. No one has ever been able to disprove it, no matter how often they've tried. Um, there was a story about, I forgot the guy's name. He's a, Voltaire said that, that it would eventually, Christianity would die out and God's word would be proven false. Well, and I don't think this is a true thing, but it's been said that Voltaire's house, after he died, ended up having a printing press in it and has been printing Bibles ever since. Because it has lasted far, out, far longer than Voltaire has. <laughs> because no one, because God's word. Jesus told Peter that nothing would overcome the church. Nothing, and he said his word would stand true forever. And up until now, it is still stood true forever. So if we can, we can trust it for that long, imagine how far in the future we can trust his word to continue to do so. He loves us, and that's why he wrote it for us. He didn't leave us, he didn't leave us out stranded someplace without any direction. He gave us his word. Gary and I were reading um, about a guy in the old in the judges this last last week, and well, the one judge came out and he was leading his, his um, Jephthah. He, he was going to lead his people to destroy the enemy because Israel was all, all beaten up by the, I don't remember which group, Hittites, I think. And he said, you know, I'm going to go out. But he, he, he could relay the history verbatim of where the people of Israel had come because they taught their people so well to go from, you know, this is what's happening. And he's, they, they talk their people by word of mouth, by the scripture continually. <laughs> Isn't she precious? And, <laughs> and she is. But um, just that Jephthah could tell his people a history, and they didn't have they didn't have the written word in their homes like we do. 
But they made sure they knew God's word so they could share it with the next generation. How important is it for us to share God's word for the next generation? Not just by passing them a Bible, but sharing them with the, sharing the truth with them. In how we live and in how we, how we teach here at church with the young people. By making sure that we tell the truth. And that we use God's word always to back it up. Jesus said, I am the truth. No one can come to the Father except through me. God has given us the truth through the life of his son Jesus Christ. Through his living word. May we read it and live it this coming week. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you speak to us. Oh, in our heart languages, Father. There are so many um, places that still do not have your word in their language. And Lord, I pray for those translators even now, today. I can think of a few at over in Papua New Guinea, Father. There's still 300 languages there that still do not have your word in their language. And Lord, your word is the same in every language. You love us, you die for us, and you want us to, to live for you as we accept that truth into our lives. And Lord, we can trust your word. Help us to trust it and to put it into practice this coming week. And Lord, help us to continue to live for you in all ways. Thank you, Father. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You would stand with us. I think we're going to sing this song.